of the, the esteemed panelists that we have, and I think they really don't require any introduction. You know, uh, to my right is Chief Judge Prost, and to her right is uh, Judge Chen, and then Judge Jordan from the Third Circuit, all here uh, to help celebrate Judge White, a judge who uh, I I'm, I'm feel very privileged to have uh, appeared before in my very first case, my very first hearing, somebody that I've held in the highest of esteem throughout my entire career uh, of over 20 years now. And so uh, my privilege to be here, my honor to be here. I, I suspect from the little I do know about Judge uh, White that he would rather we spend our time up here talking about substance and the law as opposed to himself. But I did want to start by throwing it open to the court and asking if uh, anybody here to the, to the panel, I should say, has sat with Judge White either on arguments or on panels like this or reviewed his work and, and have any reflections they'd care to share about that. I'm Chief happy Judge. to start. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I just want to say, on be can you hear me? On behalf of Judge Chen and my other colleagues on the Federal Circuit, I bring their warm welcomes, and I'd like to lend our voices to all of the tributes to you, Judge White, that you've had today. Uh, when I think about my own experiences with you, three things kind of come to mind. You probably don't remember this, but very shortly after I came on the bench 15 years ago, you were the first district court judge that I met. And that was in a symposium in Chicago. George Pappas was there. I met, met Kate O'Malley as well. And I think you saw what Kate O'Malley used to say, that I looked like a deer with the headlights. <laughs> and I think you kind of sensed that, because the very first night, you invited me to join you for dinner. And it was a pleasurable experience, and you were so low-key and so instructive, and you knew so much more about my colleagues on the federal circuit than I did. So it was always also pretty good on the gossip end. But uh, I remember it very fondly. And then, of course, you sat with our court. Former J Chief Judge Michelle had a very robust program of having visiting judges, and I think you were really one of the first, because we started at the very top. And I think you enjoyed the experience, and we did as well, learning from you and sharing cases with you. And finally, I'd just like to mention all of our law clerks. And I know I join other, my other colleagues on the Federal Circuit of having had the experience and the pleasure of getting the law clerks that Judge White has trained coming to the Federal Circuit so that we can benefit from all of his training of them. So I'd just like to say that you will be missed on the bench and that you're up to a very wise and measured and kind man. You've really been a role model to the rest of us in the judiciary. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and uh, I want to thank all the organizers and Stanford Law School for putting on this event. And uh, it's just been a pleasure to be here all day. We were a little tardy, I apologize. But to, to listen to everything uh, that was said today about Judge White, um, and I wish our other colleagues at the Federal Circuit could have been here today, but I feel grateful to have been able to be here and to participate. Uh, I've only been on the court for three years, so uh, I didn't have the pleasure of serving on a panel with Judge White. But um, I do remember back when I was just a little old attorney at the PTO, I happened to be on a conference panel with Judge White, and I doubt you remember this, Judge. It, the panel must have been about patent litigation or maybe parallel proceedings with between district court actions and PTO proceedings. And um, back then, of course, I remember that, okay, this is Judge White, this is an icon, I better make sure I sit up straight and, and not embarrass the agency. But uh, what I remember from that panel and that entire conference was Judge White's comments about um, claim construction and how there can often be a, a sneaky issue in claim construction, which is trying to figure out when a dispute between two parties can be fairly understood to be a, a claim construction dispute or is it a question of fact. And uh, he just effortlessly, during this panel, pointed at this coffee cup and saucer he had in front of him and said, well, for example, what if the claim was for a container? And of course the cup can be a container, but what about the saucer itself? It's a 
has a convex shape about it and there's a depression in the middle for the base of the coffee cup to be um, placed into the saucer. So in one sense, the saucer itself can hold liquid. Um, so what if the in accused infringing product is the saucer? Is that a claim construction issue that as a district court judge I should resolve and then uh, resolve on summary judgment? Or should I leave that for the jury to decide whether the saucer should meet the claim limitation of a container? And you know, that's a very simple example, but it's a, a very deep, vexing question that hasn't ever really gotten officially resolved by uh, the Federal Circuit, the Supreme Court, or anybody else, and it's just always uh, an issue in the trenches for district court judges, and I'm not saying it as eloquently as Judge White did 10 years ago, but it stuck with me what he said when he said it, and I just remember thinking, hmm, that's a smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so now that I'm on the federal circuit and I'm trying to pick clerks, as Sharon just pointed out, uh, there are times where when you're picking clerks or you're trying to hire or recruit clerks, you're uh, oftentimes trying to collect something, you know, and, uh, and so one of the things I've always wanted to collect since I've gotten to the court is a white clerk. And I'm very lucky to get one of Judge White's last clerks. And so I look forward to working with Roman uh, in about a year from now. Um, so that, that's my, uh, that's in, Judge White and I served on a panel together, although he was the one that said the memorable things. <laughs> Judge Jordan, any reflections from you? Yeah, I, um, one of these things is not like the others. I'm, uh, I'm on the Third Circuit instead of the Federal Circuit, and so I, I don't have any, uh, I've never had the occasion to, uh, and I'm grateful I've never had the occasion to have to review any of Judge White's work. The one time I had some sort of interaction that was close to that was uh, while Ron had uh, the, uh, the Hynix case, uh, I, uh, for a while, had the Micron case with Rambus and uh, spoliation of evidence. And I do remember very clearly sitting, this was when I was on the district court, it was a room full of patent lawyers, of course. They travel in herds and packs, and uh, <laughs> they were all in there together. Big, big courtroom full of people. And uh, the one side uh, had really a brilliant presentation, which amounted to this. This is what Judge White is doing. Uh, <laughs> which prompted me to say to the other side, why would I ever do anything other than what Ron White is doing? Uh, and there was some discussion, and I don't even remember how it came out. You know, in the end, there was a little separation between the District of Delaware and the, uh, and the uh, Northern District of California on, on the spoliation issue, but the immediate and default position was, you know, why would I ever do anything differently than Ron White would do it? I feel a little bit uh, like quoting uh, Mo Udall here and saying that uh, everything has been said, but not everybody has said it yet. Uh, <laughs> and so I'll be a little bit repetitive, but we'll take uh, a moment if I can just to say that this day has been a great day. And thank you to Paul and Gray Wall and all who have had a hand in putting it together because it's been both fun and inspiring. And that's really the perfect tribute to Ron White because being with Ron White is fun and inspiring. Uh, everything people said about him today, 100% true. Um, and the most striking thing to me has been that, you know, when I think of Ron, I, I really do, I think of three things immediately. Tremendous intellect matched with unusual modesty and genuine kindness. Those three things immediately come to mind. And today, you know, we've been talking about his intellect, but naturally he wouldn't because of item two, great modesty. Uh, but I had a chance to, uh, to see up close and personal on a trip with Ron and Ann to Brussels once. Um, all three of those things uh, on display in a panel before some of the most significant players uh, in the intellectual property world um, 
inside counsel, outside counsel, representatives of corporations who are owners of intellectual property rights, uh, and judges from around the world. And it was striking to me how universal the admiration is for Ron White. I mean, absolutely universal. Um, I think it's important to remember that he's not just a, a treasure for us. He's viewed by people all over the world uh, as an extraordinary voice of, of reason uh, and wisdom. And so it's a paradox to me how you get that kind of modesty and kindness linked up with that kind of intellect. Those, they don't always go together. <laughs> they don't always go together. And maybe the really unusual thing is that in Ron's person, they do go together and that's what produces that wisdom and the genuine love that you hear and respect. Um, so, uh, before you get into the substance, I had to add my pay on to Ron White. I'm a charter and an embarrassingly enthusiastic member of the fan <laughs> club. Well, thank you, Judge Jordan. Let, why don't we move from the man to the fruits of his labor a little bit, and, and Chief Judge Prost, I'd like to start with you. We've heard about the pioneering work on uh, uh, patent local rules and how they've benefited the district courts and practitioners. What's the impact of the patent local rules you've seen in different courts on your court? Uh, candidly, I don't, maybe my colleague disagrees, but I don't think we really focus on that. I mean, we're all well aware uh, that what the district court judges get, and they are clearly the backbone of our system, is a smorgasbord of junk. And by the time we get a patent case to our court, it's wrapped up in a box with a neat bow. And really, it is not lost on us, the hard work the district court judges have had to do to go from point A to point B. It's also not lost on us that sometimes when uh, the be all and end all before us is some issue that we notice when we look at the record and look at what the district court has done, well, not so much before the district court. So I'm sure they notice it too sometimes when they see their cases transformed on appeal to something they never recognized in the first instance. But um, as far as the, uh, the actual local rules, we don't really get too involved in the details of those. Anything different in the yeah. Third Circuit on that, Judge Shane? Oh, uh, Judge Shane, did you I've have? I've got two cents. My apologies. <laughs> uh, you have to be careful up here. First of all, everything the Chief Judge said is correct, but. <laughs> uh, and. Not but, That's and <laughs> I would say that what we see is pretty much a standardization of patent litigation from district court to district. I mean, there's of course a lot of variety, but in many ways, um, I think Judge Ilston said this, patent litigation today looks the way it looks because of these patent local rules that were developed here in ND Cal in around 2000. And so therefore there's a familiarity ultimately with the various appeals we see from different district courts uh, on a patent case. And I think it's because of the advent of the patent local rules here. Regardless if there's some variety in uh, choices made by different district courts with different patent local rules or, or different individual judges with a standing order or it comes from a court that rarely gets patent cases. My guess is what is happening is that even a judge with little to no experience with patent cases is consulting these patent local rules here to get a jump on understanding all the different variables that can come into play in a patent case so that um, by the time it arrives to us, it looks somewhat akin to what you would see coming out of NDCAL. So on that level, um, there is, we are impacted in that way. We're benefited in that way because things are organized in a certain fashion and, and there's a discipline that's been put into place in these various litigations across the country. Um, so that, I would just point out that. Yeah, we don't, you know, for the, for the local rules, the patent local rules, right, the Third Circuit just doesn't have really any interaction with that because it's, it's uh, uh, patent case focused. But the District of Delaware, where I'm 
my good friend Len Stark is in the back there and periodically I get my Oliver Twist begging bowl out and I go and say to him, Len, I'd like to have a couple of patent cases to sit on by designation as a district court judge and he and his colleagues will, you know, smile. It's the poor sad circuit judge without a real job and, <laughs> and, and we'll say, okay. <laughs> kind of, and, and they uh, they let me have a, a couple of cases for which I am truly and genuinely grateful. I don't uh, I don't want to mess that up by making it sound like I'm not grateful because I am grateful to be able to do that. Very very grateful. And when I and in that role, uh, and looking back when I was uh, a district judge, uh, I can say that those local patent rules had had a, a very sizable influence in the District of Delaware. We never have gone ahead and had you know, district-wide rules, because four district judges, you know, you get together in a room, you kind of agree, this is how we're thinking about it, and, uh, and everybody, I think, knows the standing orders, so there hasn't been a felt need to, to standardize uh, with that level of formality. Uh, but I think I'm on pretty safe ground, and certainly speaking for myself, I am, and I don't think I'd be ruled out of school by Chief Judge Stark or the, uh, or the members of the district court now uh, in saying that the, uh, that the Northern District rules are highly influential in, in thinking about how to process a case, how to stage a case, and the, and the market forces, so to speak, of litigation around the country, I mean, they, they actually operate. You all come to our court in Delaware and you bring with us uh, descriptions of best practices and suggestions, and many of those have their roots and their origination in those uh, Northern District rules, and everybody knows it. It's a given. Why don't we move to the uh, the AIA proceedings, the IPR CBMs, and the effect those are having? Uh, maybe Judge Chan, if I could start with you and, and ask, what challenges have you seen? What what impact have you seen from the explosion of these PTAB-based proceedings and how they've uh, affected the court? Yeah. Again, this is something the chief and I can totally agree on. We're at our court definitely feeling the effects of these AIA proceedings. Um, when it was passed in 2011 and then made effective in 2012, there was a lot of chatter about the coming surge or wave of appeals uh, from IPRs or CBMs or maybe even PGRs. And those first couple years, uh, we didn't really feel too much, and so we weren't that worried about it, or we, we weren't stressed about it. But this year is the first year in the history of the court where we will receive more appeals from the PTO than we do from all the district courts. Hmm. So that is a wild anomaly from the 34-year experience of the Federal Circuit where there was always something on the order of an eight to one ratio of appeals from district courts compared to PTO. And, in the, and then with re-examinations getting more popular, I guess in the 2000s, uh, there was a creep up of PTO appeals. But now with all of these AIA proceedings finally now coming to the federal circuit, I think it's something like for this past fiscal year that just ended, we'll have on the order of 650 appeals from the PTO compared to something closer to 560 from district courts. And so the number of appeals from district courts have gone down a little bit compared to the prior fiscal year, whereas uh, from the PTO, it's just been shooting up dramatically. Yeah, I mean, and just, everybody watching them with right. a microscope, too. Uh, so when I was solicitor at PTO, I can't remember, I, don't know, I guess three years ago, it was about 100. So you can see the delta is from all of these AIA proceedings. Um, that means more work, and that means we're much more of a patent-centric court than ever before. Everybody in this room probably just thinks of us as a patent court anyway, but uh, for us, you know, in our day-to-day -day work, we do a lot of non-patent work. But compared to 10, 20 years ago, uh, our court's doing uh, relatively speaking, uh, significantly less patent work than we were than we are, say, today. 
Uh, Chief Judge, do you do, do you do anything as the Chief of the Court to try to address that in advance? Is there anything you can do, uh, or do you just have to take those cases as they come? Well, we take them as they come. Uh, life gets even more complicated when we have cases pending before the Supreme Court or likely pending before the Supreme Court, because then we're left kind of adrift because we get so many of these cases on a monthly basis and have to deal with them or decide whether or not we should hold some or proceed. So life has become very complicated in patent land these days. But I would echo what Judge Chen said. We have a few former colleagues uh, uh, in the audience and they'll remember that when I first, when I first came to the court, we sit four or five days the first week in every month and we hear four argued cases. And often we'd have one district court case, maybe one PTO case, and the other two cases would be a trade case or something else that we do. Now, more often than not, all four cases are patent cases. So it makes our focus a little different. It's not something that's necessarily desirable for us. But I think Judge White may remember that I think when district court judges come to visit, they were pleasantly surprised and interested that so much of our docket uh, involved other um, areas of the law, not so much anymore. Do you see any difference in the advocates or the advocacy that you get for the PTAB oriented cases as opposed to district court cases? Mm. I think, well, I think it depends on that you're willing to say who the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I think I will say is that. Um, lawyers from, I'll just say general law firms, uh, general practice law firms, maybe appellate specialists, uh, with these AIA proceedings, they'll be looking for administrative law angles more often than, say, the, the garden variety patent lawyer who's just going to focus a lot more on why the reference doesn't teach X, it teaches Y. Um, they, they might be also tending to look for more creative arguments about the text or structure or meaning of the statute of the AIA. Um, but, you know, we will get arguments like that from, from um, the hardcore patent lawyers as well, too. But um, there, I, I do see a little bit of a distinction there. I want to get to a, a subject that I think will take much of the rest of our time, and, and maybe Judge Jordan, I'll start with you. And uh, what I'd like to do is see if we could pull back the curtain a little bit on what really happens in your courts for your appeals and what it looks like, how it proceeds, how you deal with briefing and oral argument, argument week, all of those things. And so I'm going to start with an, an extremely general question to you, Judge Jordan, which is if you were us and you hadn't clerked in your court and you hadn't worked in it, is there one thing you could think of, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists the same question, is there one thing, thing you could think of that, that we ought to know? If, if you were in our shoes and about to appear before you or about to file a brief and for you, is there one thing that, that we ought to know that would make us better advocates for you? Yeah, the, the number one challenge for me in dealing with appellate advocates, and I don't think this is, I'm, I'm guessing this is probably going to be the same across the circuit courts, including my colleagues uh, at the Federal Circuit, uh, is getting people to uh, address um, forthrightly the questions from the bench. Uh, it's a real, I mean, it's an odd thing, but it's a real challenge um, to, get, to get people to, to grapple with the hypotheticals and the direct questions put to them. I was taken with the discussion about how um, uh, gentle and uh, how effective, in fact, that's a word that came up several times as people were talking about Ron, was that he was, he was civil but also very uh, gentle in helping people through what they needed to do uh, at the court. I don't, uh, I really want to emulate that. I don't think I'm doing such a good job of it uh, sometimes because it can be a little challenging and frustrating and you want to get people to focus on the question and actually respond to it instead of assuming that it's hostile and not appreciate or trying to dodge it or something. So the, yeah, that would be, I, if I just take a moment and tell a story on myself real quick, there was a, thanks to Chief Judge Prost, we had a, we had a mock argument 
in the Federal Circuit courtroom about three, four weeks ago with some barristers from England and then a set of lawyers from the United States and doing a comparative kind of thing. And, uh, and I was just on that panel acting the way I usually do and asking a lot of questions. So I got a lot of questions. And, and afterwards, one of the barristers came up and said, well, thank you, that was very interesting. <laughs> I thought that was, you know, it was a very British and polite way of saying that was a horrifying performance on the bench. <laughs> and, uh, and today I was reflecting on that as people were talking about Judge White and how, how effective he has been in getting people to do what they need to do without being heavy handed. But hey, for lawyers out there, please just answer the, answer the question. I agree. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a young lawyer defending um, patent board decisions at the Federal Circuit. You'd go up and do an oral argument, and you'd have 15 minutes. And sometimes I'd walk out of there afterwards thinking, yes, I avoided answering Judge Dyke's <laughs> difficult question. Ha ha, I win. I just threw a wall of sound right back at him, and he, he never got me to, he never got to corner me. And that's absolutely the wrong approach. You know, you cannot treat oral argument like you're on a Sunday morning talk show where you get a question from the moderator and then you go ahead and say whatever you want to say. Um, that's entirely unproductive for us on the other side. Every question has a reason behind it. We need an answer. And if you elect not to answer it, that's ultimately, I guess, your choice. But that's just raising doubts and suspicions in my mind. And you can prattle on about whatever you want to prattle on about, but I'm going to be stewing over here wondering why you're not answering my question. Well, but well, let me push back on that on behalf of all my, uh, my uh, fellow, <laughs> oh, my fellow oh, members of the bar. Oh, a little defensive there, Doug. Oh, just, <laughs> Doug <laughs> Loomish. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, oh. What firm are you at? <laughs> it's, it's, Two O's it's, in the middle. I, uh, I've heard judges in your, in your seat say uh, more than once that the questions they're asking aren't really designed to help them decide the case as much as to extract admissions to help them build a record to improve their uh, written decision. If, if that's true, or at least sometimes true, um, uh, how do you recommend a lawyer both answer your question, but at the same time advance the interests of their client as opposed to just being cross-examined or deposed for their 15 minutes on the, uh, uh, at the podium. I actually have an answer for that. Uh, answer the question. <laughs> Seriously, that, that, is, that is, should always be the default rule. And here's the thing, really skillful advocates, and w I know in the federal circuit, uh, you're, I don't wanna butter you folks up, but the truth is the, the IP litigating bar is among the very, very finest set of lawyers in the country, maybe in the world. Highly educated, highly paid, highly motivated, working on really interesting cases, and that's just the truth. Uh, and um, you, you do your client the most service by using that training to answer the question and then pivot to what you want to talk about. And, the, and good lawyers do it all the time and they know how to answer a question without giving away too much, but, with, but being forthright and honest. And when they have to give it away because they're in the corner and there's not a way out, they're honest about it. Yeah, I, I agree. You have, you're all extremely well-trained, skillful lawyers, and you know when you can concede that an answer to say a hypothetical and then explain because you have certain set of core values of how you understand your case, why the facts of your situation don't, don't match the hypothetical or, or why the hypothetical is an illogical extension of the facts of your case. And so in the end, you have to find a way. You know, that, that's your job, not my job. <laughs> you, you have to find a way to be prepared to expect to be probed on your weak points. I mean, I go around and tell everybody, any monkey can get up there and talk about their strong points. 
You know, that's not what you're getting paid for. You're getting paid for providing good answers about your weak points. So, uh, you know, I, I'm trying not to be difficult here. I'm just trying to point out the problems that we're facing over here and trying to make sure we get it right, don't wreck the law, make sure under the applicable standard of review that uh, the right party uh, wins. But, um, you know, you, you've got to be prepared to understand and appreciate the questions that are going to be coming. Uh, if I could just add, shifting gears a little, simply because I think my colleagues would acknowledge and I think we all feel, the emphasis here has been, the discussion has been on oral argument, and while that's important, I think all of us would agree that the cases are more or less decided on the briefs in the vast majority of time. In fact, what we say in my chambers is, you might lose a case in argument, but you're much less likely to win it. So I'll just like say, make a few comments on the briefs. And we've talked about candor, some of the panelists today, the importance of candor, the importance of civility. And I'd just like to emphasize the importance of clarity. And maybe we're more sensitive to it here because district court judges have few luxuries that we don't have. But one of them is a little more time with the parties and a little more opportunity to probe. We, on the other hand, get cold briefs and the cases are pretty much decided on those cold briefs. So nothing is more important than clarity. Our colleague, Judge Toronto, likes to say, you know, we, we, have t we hear arguments and read briefs in 15 to 20 cases every three weeks, the first week in every month. So you're one of a large number. And if, as Judge Toronto says, if I have to read a paragraph in a brief more than once, either to ask myself, why is it here, or to ask myself, what are they talking about, then you've kind of lost me in the brief. So I'd just like to make that point, not about the oral argument so much, but about the importance. I mean, one could say that in the patent system, that's the problem with the emphasis, is the lack of clarity in the patent. And that's also true in the briefs we get and the important fact of that. Well, let me see if I could tie those two things together and ask you to put a number to it. I, I, have you ever and how often, <coughs> as a percentage, do you think you've changed your mind based on something you heard in oral argument as, to, as far as who won and who lost? Chief Judge? Quite rarely. Um, around the edges sometimes, I mean, uh, I, there are various great gradations. I mean, there could be information we get at the oral argument that we probe that changes some details or some aspect of what we're going to do in the case. But I think most colleagues would say it's very rare that we would come in. And we spent a lot of time getting ready for argument. We read the briefs sometimes two and three times over. It's hard to think about something that an advocate, as good as he or she may be, can say in 15 minutes that's going to flip all of that around for us. Uh, where I will say is that sometimes the emphasis or the influence comes not so much from just the advocacy, but also from hearing from our colleagues, often from the first time, and getting their view on the case based on the questions they ask at argument, which can be as influential sometimes as what the advocate is saying. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, Doug, I didn't mean to bite your head off in the spirit of I, I didn't civility take and professionalism that we're all talking about in light of Judge White. I know I'm I need to be, do better on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little irritable. I haven't had enough sleep. Just remember, it's L-O-O. -O. That's right. Thanks. But um, I, I have the same experience as the chief in the sense that I rarely change my mind after an oral argument, although it has happened, and it does happen probably a few times a year. Uh, I think if, if I had known then what I know now, I probably wouldn't have been so stressed out about oral arguments uh, when I was arguing in front of the Federal Circuit. Um, that doesn't mean you, you can't be prepared. You have to be totally prepared, and you have to be the one that knows the record and the law better than anybody else in the room and have great facility in talking about those things in front of us. But in the scheme of things, um, we do so much preparation before the oral argument and then vote right after the oral argument that it's just almost a structural necessity that we have a pretty clear idea of where we're going to go based on the strength of your briefs. 
Judge Jordan, your experience any different? Um, not really different, maybe just marginally. Uh, if I remember correctly, the Federal Circuit will hear oral, oral argument in all counseled cases, is that right? Uh, and we, we approach it uh, differently. We do not hear argument in all counseled cases. We, we pick the ones we're gonna hear for argument and um, it works out to be roughly a quarter of the cases uh, get called, not because anybody's trying to meet that number, but it just, that's how it works out. So there's, there's some culling that goes on before you get to oral argument. So if you're at oral argument, it's, you're there because something about the case troubled at least one judge on the panel enough to say, I, I wanna hear that. And often it's troubled at least one person enough for them to say, I wanna hear it, even in the face of some gentle pushing back from other colleagues on the court who might say, do we really need to hear that one? Or you know, uh, nobody ever says, hey, I'm not gonna hear that. You know, First, it wouldn't make sense because our internal operating procedures say one vote will get you in for oral argument. And the second reason is the collegiality, and the third reason is there's enough mutual respect on the court that if somebody says, no, I really wanna hear it, the other two people say, well, there may well be something here that got past me on my initial read and I, I should be paying closer attention to. So the likelihood that oral argument could change something is probably a little higher in my court only because we've washed out a lot of cases already to decide on the briefs because they just needed, they didn't need it at all. Uh, and But even in that more constricted universe of cases, usually oral argument isn't gonna turn it around, but what it may very well do is help shape the law going forward because uh, as Chief Judge Pro said, she described it as uh, on the margins and that's true, you might be on the margins of a case in the sense that it's not gonna decide who wins or loses, but it's not the margin of the case in the sense of how it may affect the law moving forward we want you in there because there's something important that we wanna talk about with you that's gonna make a difference in how we frame the decision which is gonna have an impact going down the road. And I think that's highly significant. And sometimes, like Judge Chen said and the Chief said, once in a while something will happen in that courtroom that makes you go, wow, you know, I did read these briefs again and again. And I had a terrific bench memo from a really, really smart law clerk and we talked about it and uh, you know, I don't think I ever actually fully grasped that piece of it until I heard the way that was articulated right there. That's not a, a frequent event, but it's not so infrequent as to be negligible. Well, uh, given the great or, or maybe even terrible significance then of the briefing, and maybe Judge Chen, you can start with this one. Uh, can you tell us more about how you go about actually working through the briefs? What, which ones do you read? What order? How do you decide which, even in, in the way the Federal Circuit briefs are structured, what section you start with? And how do you try to get uh, comfortable with all the facts and issues that are raised in those briefs? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, the first thing I do is read the district court opinion. Or if it's a PTAB appeal, I'll read the patent board opinion. And um, I don't know if Judge Guilford's still here, but a couple years ago I was at a conference and um, I said, when I open up that district court opinion, I'm rooting for the judge. And um, I know that Judge Guilford was so struck by that that he was on the next panel and that he kept <laughs> quoting me over and over again <laughs> in that next panel. And what I meant by that, of course, is that this is someone that's not an advocate. This is someone that has lived with this case. And this is someone who is trying, in my eyes, to teach me about this case and, and set up the playing field and tell me what issues I need to confront and, and how he or she thought was the best way to resolve it. And I'm trying to uh, understand that person's reasoning. And for me, that is the best entry into a case, typically, and so that is what I, that's what my normal approach is. Other than that, um, I wish I could say I've standardized the way I approach things. I have former clerks here, they know I have no standard way yet. Um, it, it sometimes will depend on the case. Um, 
So, um, it depends on how many cases I have, right? But um, what I think I try to do is read the summary of the arguments first, just so I can get a feel of, okay, which issues um, are still left on appeal from what the district court resolved below. And then um, oftentimes, I if it's a claim construction case, I'll read the patent. I'll say, uh, let me see if I can just figure this out. I'm going to read this patent and get to the bottom of this myself. And uh, that can be a sometimes painful, joyless exercise, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's my lot in life, so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do the best I can to make sure I get it right. So, Judge, do you have a standard process? or? A uh, it's not dissimilar to Judge Chen. I'm just uh, a lot more practical or lazy than he is because I start with the table of contents. And from there, I move to the district court opinion because there can be a lot in these district court opinions that really don't affect the issues on appeal. And whereas I might read the entire district court opinion when I read it, I want to know what I'm looking for and what's at stake in this case. Having said that, often the table of contents isn't terribly helpful, but in good briefs written by good advocates, it's a helpful roadmap in terms of following the district court judge. I will tell you, though, that um, we really work very hard. My second year in the circuit, uh, we had a judicial conference, and all of us were on the en banc panel with Carter Phillips as the moderator, and I remember, I think it was Judge Dyke, when they asked him how he prepares for oral argument, he said, I read the briefs three times before oral argument. And I was ready to fall off the stage. I had just come to the court, and I had gotten my stack of briefs for the first month, and the thought of reading those three times was just beyond my comprehension. <laughs> now, having said that, I read the briefs probably three times too, but not from cover to cover. You know, you read the district court opinion first, you go through the briefs to get a sense of the case. I always read them the third time though, right before, or shortly before argument, because that's the point in which you've discussed the case with your clerks, you've read the bench memo, you know it. And then when you read the briefs, you really see them for what they're worth and you really can call out really what they're saying, and they have sort of a different meaning. I'm reading them completely differently the third time than I did the first. Judge Jordan, you start with the uh, table of contents, you start at the beginning and go to the end, or do you take a different approach? It's actually not that different from what my colleagues have just said. Uh, often I will start with the table of contents because in a good brief it really will tell you these are the issues and if, it, and if it's one of the, a poorer written brief where it just says, you know, it doesn't give you any information in the, in the table of contents, then I'll go over to the statement of issues presented section and, uh, and take a look at that. And that gives some orientation for how to approach the district court opinion, which is uh, uh, a place to, yeah, to start. You know, I, I do think that it's something that... Um, uh, Judge Gaiarza said earlier uh, today bears r repeating. You don't you don't want to be playing favorites as a circuit court judge. Like I really like that district judge. I really don't like that. But there is a there's a normal distribution on judges, just like there is in the population. Now the curve is shifted to the right because even uh, a district judge who you think isn't. Uh, far out on that curve to the to the right is still an extraordinary person and is going to be right the vast majority of the time. But there are some judges who you see their work repeatedly over and over again and you just know the, it's not that they're flawless, you know. I, you, you occasionally send down a vacate and remand because uh, Homer nodded, but but you really do have an appreciation for that work and so I think it's just remarkably fortunate for the practicing patent bar that uh, that Ron White came along when he did when there was such a ferment in the in, in the patent law sometimes fate or divine intervention or just blind good luck puts the right person in the right place at just the right time and Ron was just the right person in just the right place at just the right time to help influence the law because circuit judges were reading his work and understanding, well, this is right. I mean, how many people get their, how many people get their work 
not just adopted by circuit courts, but ending up in statutes. I mean, how do you get Congress to agree on anything? But even evidently, congressmen and senators agree that Ron White is right, right? So <laughs> it works its way into statutes. It's really quite remarkable. So good district court opinion uh, is where I, I spend a lot of time because that just helps clarify the issue so well. Now, let me stay with you for a moment and ask you how you use your clerks in the process. How do you decide uh, which clerks get the case? Is it based on their background? Do you always get presentations from them? Do you always get memos? Do you use those? How do you use them? In every argued case, I get a bench memo, uh, and it's a very thorough bench memo. Um, and I count on my clerks to find the gaps that you guys leave, <laughs> I guess. Um, if they've done their job right, uh, they'll, they'll not only be able to say, well, this position is the stronger because of what was cited in the briefs, but they'll also be able to say, uh, uh, and there are these other policy ramifications or these other issues, or here's something that everybody missed. So I, I, I don't want to be in creative, you know, it's not a kind of a where's Waldo thing, like find the error and uh, keep hunting. Uh, what it is is get those exceptionally smart, capable people to give you the most dispassionate view of the two competing sides as you can get, and th that's extraordinarily helpful. And Judge Chen, you've mentioned your clerk several times. How do you utilize them? How do you get the best out of them for, for your purposes? Um, you know, I, I look at them as a network of brains that I can access for, for my own, you know, regular brain, and um, I can benefit uh, by hopefully arriving at a better, more informed decision uh, through them. And so what that means is, of course, bench memos. Um, and sometimes the bench memo is really just a launching pad for more questions and conversation and, and a lot of email traffic. Um, sometimes a bench memo will come in. It could be they feel like they've They've done a really comprehensive job, and of course they have, and it might be a 30, 35 page bench memo, but then they'll see 15, 20 questions come in by email, and then we're running down those uh, 15, 20 questions back and forth. Um, because, I don't know, I'm a chatty Cathy, we have rolling conversations throughout the month, every month about in the lead up to uh, uh, court week, and, and every court week I say is like, finals week. So we have 12 finals weeks uh, a year, mm -hmm. and, and, and they love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he thinks. No. They tell me that. So. <laughs> Chief Judge, uh, do you have a different... Well, uh, I think Judge White said at lunch that the best part about this job are our clerks, uh, because they, you know, it's, it's odd in this job, because you, mean t you create a very, very close relationship with people, and it's like, unlike most jobs, I think, where you only have them for a year or so. So you develop this relationship with them that's very intense, and it's only temporary. And every year at the end of the year is so sad. It's hard to let go. You realize they're going on to better things and you realize that you always maintain the same family, but it's really disconcerting to have the people leave. And the only encouraging thing about it is you know you're gonna get a whole new crew out of clerks with whom you're gonna develop a similar relationship. So it's kind of an aspect of this job which makes it different than any other I've had, and it's part of the wonderful thing about being on the court. Let me ask you now uh, how you might collaborate with each other, with other judges, with uh, your colleagues. Do you, do you have a red phone on your desk somewhere you pick up and uh, <laughs> to share notes, to, to discuss thorny issues? I mean, 101 is the one that jumps to mind for me. And thinking about this challenging area of law or any other challenging area of law, do you want to get the benefits of the thoughts of other colleagues, even if they're not on the panel with you, even if they're not working on the matter with you, in order to just try to uh, harmonize your thinking. Anybody who'd care to answer that? Well, I'll just say for the Federal Circuit, we realize how fortunate, oops, sorry. Uh, that's one of my colleagues calling, actually. <laughs> <laughs>
It's Judge Clevenger. I cannot tell you how happy I am that it is not my phone. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I turned mine off. I really apologize. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, well, the, f the Federal Circuit is unusual as a circuit. We realize how fortunate we are, which is we're all in the same building on two floors of a building. And that allows us to have very easy interaction with each other. It helps the clerks. We have all of the clerks interact all of the time and we're all close by. Um, even though it's amazing, and I'm sure a lot of you will identify, that I can have a million emails with a colleague or phone calls and they're just down the hall. And every once in a while we realize we haven't seen each other in a week <coughs> and we get together and talk. But it's a luxury we have that I think helps us really interact with each other. And the, and the issues are hard. So they always, we always benefit from each other and from hearing each other, hearing the similar cases that are floating around the court and learning from each other in that regard. Yeah, if, if there's some tough vexing issue, it could be a takings case, it could be a tax case, it could be a patent issue. Um, you know, if I've seen a judge on our court who was the author of some key case that I have to figure out which way to build off of, you know, it's, it's a great resource to be able to check in with that judge and, and uh, pick his or her brain on, on that issue and, and try to see if that person's willing to engage in a conversation with me about that case. And I would imagine they usually are, or is that not always the case? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think there is a very strong collegiality culture at the Federal Circuit. And, um, you know, everybody's busy, but at the same time, um, I haven't been turned away yet. That's good. Different, uh, different courts have uh, different cultures around how, how the interaction takes place. Um, I've discovered, uh, in fact, I'll be meeting with my colleagues at a special uh, retreat here after I get off the red eye from this from this, uh, this get-together to talk about uh, um, how we should handle in banks, for example. And Chief Judge Prost was kind enough to share with us some of the information from their uh, court. And we, so we, you know, sometimes we even reach outside our own court to try to find out how are things going. But the typical thing in our court, partly it's, it's geographic distribution is different, so we're not all in the same building. Uh, but partly it's, it's culture and custom, there's not as much of that uh, discussion as there is on the Federal Circuit. And I've, I've had the good fortune to share law clerks several times with the chief. Uh, hopefully I'll get to do that with Judge Chen at some point too. And, um, uh, and I just know they've had a, uh, a different experience. I hope it's been an equally good experience on our court as they uh, then have at the Federal Circuit. But there's a lot of interaction, they tell me, at the Federal Circuit amongst the clerks. They, they are interacting a lot. And there's, it's a little more compartmentalized in our court. And some of the judges actively, do, they, they view it as, I want to go in without any interaction because I want to have a, uh, an unfiltered, an un, I don't think they'd say tainted, but maybe that's what they're thinking, an untainted perspective on it as they're looking at the case. So they won't. They don't want to talk about it at all. And others feel like, well, you know, we can kick it around just a little bit when we're picking the cases for oral argument. But it's um, it's no less collegial for that. It's just a little bit different. The real the real discussion takes place in earnest after the argument. You get back in the room and you're wrestling it to the ground. Thank you. So uh, we only have a few minutes left. I think I would ask you uh, about the future for our last question. As Judge White retires, I think we've heard a lot about the, uh, the hole he'll leave in the bench here and the, the shoes that are difficult to fill. Um, how, as either uh, a court or maybe collectively here together, all of us, how do we uh, better grow the future to make sure that there are advocates and judges and, and folks who uh, will step up as the next generation to really continue the work of people like Judge White, but, but also just uh, to, to advance patent law and patent litigation. Well, maybe some, some of it is by example, and that's why we are all paying tribute to Judge White today for all he's done and the example he set for all of his clerks and all of his colleagues. 
I think all my former clerks are exceptional, so I fully expect their firms to do the right thing and, and help them build their careers. Uh, but I guess I think one of the points is how do we get them to have the right experiences in order to be successful in the profession. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, there is this wonderful pro bono program at the Federal Circuit where uh, a lot of young attorneys get experience drafting briefs, arguing cases at the Federal Circuit, um, getting that stand-up experience while also uh, providing a valuable service in um, helping veterans with their uh, benefits claims. So uh, things like that and, and to whatever degree that um, they can, uh, younger attorneys can also get arguments in, in court. Maybe that's harder at the federal circuit, but maybe at the district court level. Um, or even allowing younger attorneys to have a moot court experience. Maybe they were one of the primary drafters of the brief, but they're not going to actually be the one to argue it. But why not let them run through a moot court and let the the big partner watch how that person uh, performs and, and not only coach up that person, but see if there's certain nuggets that will be helpful to the ultimate oral argument. There's, there's all kinds of ways, I think, but I think firms, companies need to be conscious of this to, to make sure that younger attorneys are getting the right experience. Judge Jordan, are the younger lawyers getting the right bats in the Third Circuit? They are. Uh, frequently it's in pro bono uh, cases and that's a significant and an important thing. Um, but there are outside the courtroom ways to get it done the way Judge Chen has just mentioned. You know, earlier it was mentioned that Judge White had taken a leadership role in an American Inn of Court. I, you know, I heartily recommend the American Inns of Court as a venue in which you can uh, do some training for young lawyers, important training for young lawyers. Uh, and maybe the most significant thing is uh, the, uh, the example that the chief just mentioned. The, uh, Judge Walker uh, said here earlier uh, that it was, you know, we, we don't really realize how much the law has changed, some of us, since we went on the bench. And I'm sure that's true, but I can tell in some seemingly insignificant ways that it really is true. You know, if I, if I walk outside my ivory tower at lunch, I, I don't see lawyers on the street at lunch like I used to. You know, people don't go out and interact and uh, it, it feels like the pace of things and the competitive pressures are such that there's uh, a different dynamic and so the, the chance to pass on the um, the culture of the law as a noble profession and uh, a civil exercise uh, is going to take more deliberative effort than it did in the past because it won't just happen by osmosis the way it did in earlier generations because of those informal interactions. So, you know, I think as in so many other things, uh, Judge White has set a strong example for us by finding ways to uh, more more formal or structured ways, making those occasions where you can teach and mentor and making sure they happen. No, I, I can personally attest to that. I, as I mentioned, my first case, my first hearing was in front of Judge White and uh, he is uh, as generous as any judges I've ever seen. Generous for me is the word that always comes to mind when I think of him and the way he treated me and the respect and, and uh, uh, welcoming way in which he uh, allowed me to argue in his court as a young lawyer and probably uh, stepping ahead of myself a little bit. So with that, it's 4 o'clock. I think uh, I want to just thank you so much for your candor, for coming here today, and uh, thank you, Judge White. Thank you all. Uh, you know, in these times, as much as any, uh, human decency and a public servant is something that we can all celebrate. And in honoring Judge White today, I think uh, we've done a wonderful job of that. I, Really appreciate, uh, especially the, the visitors from um, far places and red eyes and everything else that made a big effort to get here. 
Thank you, Judge White, and thank all of you.